hope you're enjoying worship so far. What a wonderful time of worship so far today. And I trust that God's going to do some amazing things here uh, in this uh, fellowship of believers today. My name is Michael Moore, and I'm the pastor here at Beacon Hill Church. We are a new, growing uh, just family of believers who want to make much of Jesus Christ. That's who we are. That's what we want to do. And so many people ask me, uh, how did we get our name Beacon Hill? Like, where did Beacon Hill come from? Did we just start meeting here and we decided to name our, ourselves after the theater? And really, the answer is no, we, we didn't do that. Uh, what happened is, when it was evident that God was doing something in our lives, that, that He wanted us to start something, we were driving around Hopewell and we literally started praying and we said, what if the gospel got a hold of this town? Like, really got a hold of this town? What would it look like, right? And so, there's a lot of churches doing some great things for the kingdom here in Hopewell, but there still remains a, a lot of lost people who need to know about this Jesus who we boldly proclaim. And so, what if the gospel really got a hold of this town? Like in Acts 17, 6, if, if this town was turned upside down by the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so, we sat there and said, like, we want to make it our mission to teach people about Jesus how to have a relationship with Jesus, and then how to teach people to, about Jesus. That, that's really what the Great Commission calls us to do. So that is our mission. And so we believe that when the gospel gets a hold of you, that you can't help but tell other people about it. Amen? I mean, we want to, to tell other people about this king that we, that we proclaim. And so even church people, those who have been around church all their lives, you know, we can get... Um, in our slumber, we can get apathetic towards the gospel. We even need to be reminded of God's grace and His mercy and His love in our lives. And so, matter of fact, I, I heard it this week, that we should preach the gospel to ourselves daily before we try to preach it to anybody else. We need to be reminded of the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so, when we came as a church, we, we said we want to be the light of Christ in this community. We want to, to shine the light of Christ. And so we named our church after Matthew chapter 5, verse 14 through 16. It says, you are a city set on a hill, a light that cannot be hidden. We want to, to shine our light and that when people see our good works, they will give glory not to us, but to our Father who is in heaven. And then we, we came right up and we saw the Beacon Theater and we said, we want to be a beacon of light for the city of Hopewell. Amen. And I pray that's what we're doing. Pray that, yeah, go ahead. Hey, don't be afraid to give God glory today. Because that's what we're trying to do here. That, that's our mission as a church. And so how do we do that? How, how do we draw it close to Him? Because we've been here for about three months, going on four months, and man, we have seen some life change happen. We have seen life change happen. We have seen what only Christ can do in people's lives. And we just believe that if you learn more about Jesus. It's going to change your life, and it's going to change the lives of your friends and your family and your co-workers. And so we're on a mission to, to make much of Jesus Christ here at this church. And so we've been going through this study called uh, Creation to Christ, just going through the Bible, teaching people about Jesus. That's what we focus here on Sundays. So we started off in Genesis, and then we went to Exodus, and then we had a riveting time in Leviticus. And then today, we're actually in Isaiah 53, so I invite you... If you have uh, uh, your Bible with you, to turn with me to Isaiah 53, which is where we will be studying this morning. If you don't have a copy of God's Word with you today, that's okay. We got you covered. Uh, we have the Big Hill crew that has Bibles for you. Just raise your hand, and they will bring one to you right now. Just raise your hand, and they'll be happy to bring you a copy of God's Word. And so we're studying Isaiah 53. And I believe that when you really understand the story of the Bible, that the Bible is not about us, that it's about Jesus. It will change your outlook on everything. And so we really want to, to pinpoint uh, what it means uh, to, to understand the Bible and the purpose and the mission of the Bible. And so when we look through Scripture from Genesis to Revelation and everywhere in between, we see Jesus all over it. But probably nowhere more than in Isaiah 53 do we see just a great picture of of Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, this has been called by, by Polycarp uh, one of the, the golden passional of Old Testament prophecies. Another uh, commentator actually says, when you come to this scripture, you this scripture is the loftiest, deepest, most awesome thing that Old Testament prophecy has ever achieved. And yet another commentator said it like this. 
When you go into Isaiah 53, you are entering the Holy of Holies of Scripture. My favorite and most succinct description of Isaiah 53 comes from H.B. Charles. He simply says it like this. Isaiah 53 is the heart of the gospel. If you want to know the meaning of the gospel, you want to know the meaning and the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, then you can understand the facts about the life and the death of Jesus by reading the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But if you really want to meditate on the meaning of the life and death of Jesus Christ, then you fixate and study Isaiah 53. So important to the message of the cross, to the message that Jesus Christ came and, and died on the cross for our sins and resurrected and will be coming back one day. So central to the message of salvation is Isaiah 53 that it is mentioned either in part or in whole in 85 passages in the New Testament. This passage that we are embarking on this morning is something that we need to understand. And Isaiah, when he starts off in chapter 53, verse 1, he, he asks two questions. He asks two questions to the people that are listening. Matter of fact, you've got to understand his audience. His audience in Isaiah 53, he believed, were unbelieving Jews. These are people who had heard much about the Messiah, but they hadn't placed their faith and trust in the Messiah as the one who could give them salvation. So he asked his audience two questions, and I'll ask those to you today. He says, who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? The, the first question is just so simple. He says, who has believed what he has heard from us? This wasn't the first time that they had heard the prophecy of the coming Messiah. They had heard it over and over again, yet few believed. And that's one of the most frustrating things for me. That while there's three billion people in this world who have never heard about the name of Jesus, here in America, in Virginia, in Hobel, there are countless people who have heard about the gospel of Jesus Christ and fail to believe that this Jesus that we boldly proclaim. And yet, as Galatians 6, 9 says, to not grow weary in doing good, but at the proper time to reap the harvest if you don't give up. This is what Isaiah is about to do. He is about to boldly proclaim the coming Messiah, whether or not they believed it or not. And I'm here today to tell you, if you have the truth, and you know the truth, and you believe the truth, don't worry about what everybody else thinks. You keep on preaching the truth. And this is what Isaiah says. He says, who has believed it? You've got to understand that, that in this day and time, few believe the prophecies that were being said. In the days of Jesus, the, the rulers and the Pharisees didn't believe the message of the cross. Even when the apostles went out, even when the apostles went out, they told many people, but few believed. And yet, today, many people hear the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ, but few believe. And I'm here today to tell you to keep on preaching the truth. Do not deny the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He says, who has believed what you have heard from us? But secondly, he gives us an explanation and an answer to why people do not believe or haven't believed. It says this. He says, who has the arm of the Lord been revealed? That's the second question in chapter 53, verse 1. Who has the arm of the Lord been revealed? We need to understand that it takes divine revelation for people to understand the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You can't understand anything in this word unless the Holy Spirit allows you to understand it. The arm of the Lord, the saving power is the arm of the Lord. And I want you to know that Michael Moore has not saved anyone ever. You will not save anyone ever. It is the power of God unto salvation. Jesus Christ and only Jesus Christ saves. So then we understand this. As Isaiah chapter 52 verse 10 
boldly proclaims that we all have heard. The arm of the Lord has been bare amongst all of us. We have heard the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Then why don't they believe? And i got to tell you, there's this one guy named Wilmer in Martinique. The first time that I, that I met him, uh, he literally runs this bar in Martinique right by the prostitution zone. There, there's prostitutes all around his bar. And, and, and when I came, his wife had been praying for him for forever, and she was a, a believer. And, and yet her husband, literally every time I saw him, he, he got drunk. And I invited him to church. I was a guest preacher, right? I mean, just picture this, a guest preacher coming in. And I, I invited him to church. I wanted him to hear the, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, you know, Wilmer came. He came to church. He was so drunk, he couldn't even stand. And he brought uh, with him as his driver someone who was drunker than him, who drove him to church. And y'all, I, I mean, I can't even imagine the praise team. Imagine this happening. This literally happened. They have a chair for me where I sit in the back of the praise team and, and waiting to preach. And so Wilner and his friend are in there in this packed house. Uh, they are drunk as can be. And Wilner's friend decides that he wants to play bongos. Sure, why not? Seems normal. Walks down the aisle, gets up, and just starts playing bongos in the middle of the set. They, they play music for three hours. This homeboy played bongos for three hours. I was, I was just in shock. I didn't even know what to do, right? Because they're like, you brought him. You brought him, you know, preacher. And I'm like trying to hide a little bit. So then Wilder, my friend, he gets a phone call on his cell phone. Y'all, he answered the phone and starts screaming loud during worship. Everyone is staring at him. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't even know what to do right now. And so, so um, as they're staring at him, and they start to yell at him because they're trying to worship and they're trying to understand and he starts and goes, Pastor Michael, they're bothering me. <laughs> I just want to hide, man. I just want to hide. And, uh, and I said, I got you. And he goes, like back to me. And I'm like, oh my goodness gracious. I just, I just want to hide. And you know, when I um, saw Wilmer again, he had given up drinking completely. He still runs the bar. He had given up drinking completely. And um, we saw him just a couple of weeks ago. And, it's been four years and he has hardly touched a drop of alcohol. And yet, I know and his wife knows that's only the work of the Holy Spirit that's working on his life and has changed his life. But he's just yet to turn his life over to Jesus. I mean, all the signs are around him, all of the truth of the gospel, he just doesn't understand. And there's so many people that, that don't understand the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. They try to attribute, attribute life change to other things as to love or happenstance instead of the power of the gospel to change lives. And when you look at Isaiah chapter 53, there are critics that try to discount the truth of this gospel. They, they try to say that this isn't about the Messiah. They, they literally try to say, when you read Isaiah 53 as a believer, you know that it's not talking about anybody but the Messiah. Yet, the unbelieving Jews, the people who, who don't believe in the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, they try to assign it to somebody else. They try to say that Jeremiah is the one that they're talking about. That, that maybe uh, Joseph is the one that they're talking about. They even said that maybe the nation of Israel is who they're talking about. While they have critics, and there will always be critics, to the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Make no bones about it that this passage is talking about the Messiah, the one who came to seek and save that which is lost. And Isaiah wasn't afraid to share that truth with them. Regardless of what other people thought, they understand that there were people that weren't going to understand the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But keep on preaching. Don't worry about what people think or what they say. Keep on preaching. And so... When it comes to sharing the truth, when Isaiah is just sharing the truth of the gospel, when we see here in verse 2, he, he's telling the people that the Messiah that you're expecting is not the one who is the Messiah. I remember back in government class, back in high school, literally, y'all think about how far our presidential elections have come. I was given a profile of who a president of the United States looks like. I was told that the President of the United States 
had a, a certain socioeconomic background. He was of a certain race, of a, of a certain gender, that he would act a certain way. And I, I think we see today that, that that profile has changed a little bit. And so we see here that although they were looking for one description of the coming Messiah, the scripture says that there's somebody completely different that is right before them. Look with me at verse 2 in chapter 53. He says, for he grew up before him like a young plant. Understand this, that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. We're, we're going to tell the Christmas story next week. And, and outside of the, the, the phenomenal events of the birth of Jesus Christ, his life was very ordinary. You understand that we don't see much of, of his upbringing in Scripture, but it says here that he was brought up like a young plant before him. Jesus had to learn how to walk, how to talk. He had to learn to do the things that we did. Like a young plant, he had to be nurtured and cared for. But notice this, what the Scripture says in verse 2, he had to be brought up before him. Who is him? It is not his earthly parents, but he was brought up under the loving care and guidance of God the Father who was watching him and caring for him like a young plant. And he says this secondly, this Messiah is like a root out of a dry ground. I don't know about y'all, but if you just watch a plant and then you wake up one morning and it's like full grown and you don't even know how it got there, you imagine a root out of a dry ground with no moisture, nothing to make it look like it could grow or be worth anything. They can be fragile as can be. And yet, the gospel of Jesus Christ started off like a mustard seed out of a dry ground, a root that is something so simple that we wouldn't even notice. And thirdly, notice what it says here. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him. And no beauty that we should desire him. See, they were looking for the conquering king. They, they were seeing some royal lineage coming in. And yet there was nothing on the outside that would make us even want or notice our coming Messiah. But the inside was beautiful. It was holy. And this is the Messiah that was coming. This is the description of the upbringing of the Messiah that Isaiah is giving. And yet when you look at Philippians, and y'all if you can just make a note or you can... Look there, it is so awesome to look at Philippians chapter 2 that we see that although that he was in the form of God, he emptied himself and became a servant. He became a servant so that we could know the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he says this, the, the, the one who would, would give up literally being with God the Father to come down so that we could know the truth, how would we treat him? And Scripture literally says here that he was despised, he was rejected, he was a man of sorrows, he was a, acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. This is how our Messiah was treated. This is how our Messiah was treated when he was on earth. He was despised, he was rejected. And you know today that people reject him? Like when, when Jesus was, 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 was living, he was rejected by his own family? People rejected him when they told the truth of him, and people still reject him today. And yet, and yet, he still loves us that he would come and do this for us. And we see in verse 4, when Isaiah is talking to the unbelieving Jews, he says, Surely, surely, he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. He's reminding them of the fallen nature of humanity, that we are sinners, that there is not a person in this room today that has not experienced grief. There's not a person in this room today that has not experienced sorrow. Has anybody not been through grief and sorrow and pain and hurt? And yet, many people, they mistakenly try to carry that burden of grief. They mistakenly try to carry that burden of sorrow. And Isaiah is saying this, don't try to carry what you are not meant to carry. Give it to Jesus. He is the one who bore our grief. He is the one who bore our sorrows. He is letting them know the purpose of why he came. 
And yet, people misunderstood him. They literally thought that he was punished by God. He was smitten by God. He deserved what he was getting. Literally, y'all. One time, we were working with some homeless people, and I asked this one person who is in the church if he wanted to come and help us serve the homeless. And he says, why do you want to help them? They deserve what they get. Let them wallow in their sins. And yet, when I look at the gospel of Jesus Christ, I am so thankful that Jesus didn't let us wallow in our sins. He didn't leave us to where we deserved. And it shows us that he came to be a substitute, to take on our sins. Listen to what it says here. It says he was pierced for our transgressions. This is 700 years, 700 years before he would come in the flesh. And Isaiah is prophesizing what would happen. He says, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chast chastisement that brought us peace. Do you understand? Do you understand that, that the thorns on his head wounded him? Do you, do you understand that, that the nails crushed him? Do you understand that the piercing from the soldiers, they hurt him, they wounded him, and yet the scripture says they literally crushed him. There is no other uh, uh, description in the Hebrew word that we can use here to, to say a more finalized punishment that he got, that our Savior got, that we deserve than being crushed. Yet, verse 7 tells us he had a chance to vindicate himself, to, to say the truth, to tell him that, that it's not me. It's not me that he did it. But Scripture says he was oppressed. He was afflicted. He didn't open his mouth. He didn't, when he was before the judge, he could have relieved himself. He could have said, I'm innocent. But like a lamb that is led to slaughter, and like a sheep that before it shears is silent, he did not open his mouth. Why? Because he didn't come to save his life, but our life. That was why he came. And yet the generation... He talks about the generation and, and, and the different commentators. They, they don't know if they're talking about that generation or all generations. But the fact of the matter is, we have cut him off. We have not been who we should be. He cut him off. We stricken for the transgression of my people. And then verse 9. I don't think people understood this. Do you understand like when Jesus Christ was on the cross, he had two thieves beside him? And he was assigned the grave that every other thief was going to get. He was going to go right, right in the grave with the rest of the people. This is what the scripture says in verse 9. They made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death. Although he had done no violence, he had done no wrong, there was no deceit in his mouth. It was only because Joseph asked Pilate for his body that he was buried where he was buried. But that wasn't the grave that was assigned to him. And yet... When we look at this, we think, how, how, could, how could God the Father who watched out over him, who, who watched him as a young plant, allow this to happen? And it says in verse 10, it was the will of the Lord to crush him, to put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for, for grief, for guilt. This was God's plan. When we look at the beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ, we see it was God's plan all the time to, to reconcile a lost and sinful world to him. And the only way that they could do that was if his son would give his life, the life and the death of Jesus Christ. But I got some good news for you this morning. Look at verse 10. He shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. I got a question for you. How can he prolong his days if he is dead? Unless he was resurrected from the dead. Do you, do you see the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ here? See, while other people have a, a dead Savior, we have a Savior who is not dead but alive, who is watching over us right now. And it says that it pleased him. 
by his knowledge and righteousness will my servant make many to be accounted righteousness, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the name, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the, the sinners. Yet he bore the sin of many. He bore your sin. He bore my sin so that we can live and make intercession for the transgressors. I want you to understand today two questions. Do you believe what you have heard today? Do, has the, the arm of the Lord revealed to you the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ? That, that Jesus Christ came so that you could live. He died a horrible death. He took on your sins. He bore your grief. You bore your sorrows. You don't need to sit there and carry burdens anymore because Jesus Christ has done that for you. Don't live your life like it's lost in sin. Give your life to Jesus Christ. But I want you to know, believe we're here today. There will be people who reject the truth. There will be people who treat you wrongly. But the word says, if they hate you, remember they hated me first. And he's worth it. 